And at the end, the president of Y Combinator got up on stage with one of the largest AI investment venture funds. And they said, you just don't understand what's going to happen. Like you're all tech people, you're all using AI. You still don't understand how big this is. This is bigger than the industrial revolution. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business podcast, a project of the p Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the p headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, this is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, John Derbyshire. John is the founder of SmartSuite. As a three-time founder, he sold his last company for $200 million. Throughout his career, John has been dedicated to automating everyday essential business tasks to create smarter, more efficient organizations, no matter what the industry. In our conversation, John and I discuss how SmartSuite user was able to save $8,000 per month thanks to AI and automation. Learn how to incorporate feedback from your clients in everything you do. Know the way John breaks down the steps to finding the proper, proper management tool for your business. Finally, don't miss his advice of how to go about implementing new systems in your company. This and so much more only on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Let's get right to our conversation with John Derbyshire. John, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to getting into it. Yeah. So I've been following what you're doing now with Smart Suite. Um, we've been playing around with the software as well. And, and I know that this is not your first one. You've been involved in technology. You've been, you've passed a couple of great exits. Um, so for our listeners, just to, to set the tone, give us a little bit of your backstory as far as how you got into technology and some of the stories about pre Smart Suite. And then we'll get a little bit into the Smart, Smart Suite story. Sure. Happy to. Yeah, I'm probably pretty similar to a lot of entrepreneurs in that I came out of college with accounting and finance degree <laughs> um, and used that for just a few years. This kind of sparked me into the tech space where I wanted to be that was there. But that was my entry point uh, that was there. My first really big job out of school was uh, I had the opportunity to be a direct admit partner at Ernst & Young and to build one of their global consulting practices. What became um, cybersecurity uh, that was there. And we had about 1,500 people in that practice. I was there for about four, four and a half years. That's where I really cut my teeth on understanding how to really build a business and all the internal workings. Uh, Ernst & Young is very process driven. So everything we did was broken out into a process. So that's really stuck with me through my career on the importance of having process to really scale a business. I left Ernst & Young with an idea to build a no-code platform that would help manage cybersecurity processes inside large companies, which later became governance, risk, and compliance. Um, that company in the first three years, uh, 29 of the top 30 financial services companies became customers, and in about five years, 75 of the Fortune 100 that's there. So we were very enterprise focused. We were very targeted on the people that we reached out to for customers that was there. We that company um, became a unicorn. Uh, it's still in the same location. We, we built that company in Overland Park, Kansas, where I was living at the time. Uh, it's still in the same location. We've got many employees that are there over 20 years with the company. It's just a great story on how col culture affects the business long term with the people you hire that's there. And I'd love to get into some of that later in the discussion. I sold um, Archer Technologies and did what most people would do. I thought I wanted to retire at a young age and got really bored after about three years. Played a lot of golf, did a lot of travel. I did a lot of investing, advising, and realized that at heart, I have a passion for building software. And, and I want to get up in the morning and have a passion to go do something. And I lost that when I sold Archer. So fast forward, we started um, SmartSuite about four and a half years ago. And um, about four years ago, I guess now in the no code space, but we wanted to take a new approach to how organizations could manage any process or project in their company on a single platform. And I think we'll dive into that a little bit more and what that means. But that was kind of the the genesis of, of Smart Suite. Very cool. So I want to go back to 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 um, your, your past exit um, on uh, Archer for a minute, and then we'll get into Smart Suite um, and two things that you mentioned. One is obviously there was an exit. So I want to get into the mindset of, 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 of somebody in the tech space that has gone through exits. And this is something that I hear a lot. So sometimes you could see a CEO that's building a technology company 
and only for the purpose for the exit. And then are people that are building it brick by brick, day by day, feature by feature. And exit might be, you know, down the road, but that's not in their, in, in the immediate um, site. Have you had exit as the, you know, the poster child, so to speak, of this is where we're going, this is where we're going? Yeah, at Archer, you know, we built that business as a true lifestyle business, meaning that it was a profitable business from year one. And we wanted to, to you know, basically have a business that we had control over and could hire the people that we wanted to hire. We were bootstrapped until year eight and a half. And we brought in some external capital at that time, not because the business needed capital, but because my wife and I had all of our kind of financial assets in the business that was there. So it allowed us to take some of the money off the table to continue to grow uh, that was there. But what happened after that is pretty interesting in that we had a lot of acquisition offers that started happening in year nine because we were such a profitable business, the location that we are in, the market share that we had. So that lifestyle business became very valuable to larger companies kind of inside of their portfolio. So we had a Remember, I guess a little less than 200 employees. We sold to EMC that had 43,000 employees. Give you an example. So we became part of a much larger company. I stayed for about a year and helped do the transition that was there, but they really turned on the global sales engine for Archer, something that we hadn't had. We had some global companies, but we didn't have a presence with the international sales team. And they showed us very quickly that enabling a sales team with the type of technology that we built at Archer double, triple the size of the company just in a matter of years uh, that was there. And it had very high profit margins already. And it just it generated a lot of positive cash flow. I want to get to something that you also mentioned, which is you spoke about culture. And I know in my listeners that are listening to the show knows, know, know pretty well how much I focus on culture. And I always say, it, you know, if CEOs speak about culture, I want to, I want to see their calendar. I want to see how much time they're actually putting in to work on their culture. Because it's easy to say, I want to have a good culture, but then, you know, putting, putting time to it and making sure that that's what you have. I guess when it comes to the tech industry in particular, a lot of companies are focused on talent and because we need to run fast, we need to have the best engineers, we need to have data analysts and you are in the cybersecurity so that it's a talent on its own. How did you balance making sure that you're getting great talent, but ultimately making sure that you're bringing in people that are great for the culture? It's amazing that you're asking this question. Not many people understand the balance between those two facets that you just mentioned, but the story at Archer is we started with a core team of about six to seven people in the first year, delivered the first iteration of our product, and then we needed to start to grow. And the first thing that we said was, how are we going to connect with people that make sense for us to hire? And we decided that on average, the people we needed to hire had somewhere between two and five years of experience. And we wanted to bring them into our our company and train them on how we wanted to do things. We thought it was a little unique. So for, at first, we were very specific on the years of experience that they had. The second thing that we determined was that people that came out of Ernst & Young, IBM, Deloitte, Accenture that had a consulting background were the perfect candidates across our company in a lot of different roles, just because they had received so much training in the first 18 months to two years. Like Accenture has a year program that they go through before they start working. So they came to us with ready-made skills on not just consulting, but project management and a lot of process that was there. The next thing that we did was we looked at our six to eight employees that we had and said, who do you know <laughs> that you would like to work with that you feel would fit the culture we're trying to build? And we hired in the early days, I can't imagine that we hired more than four or five people outside of referrals from people we hired at SmartSuite. And that got so much traction, we actually gave $2,500 for any referral that an employee made that uh, stayed with us for a year. So there was like incentive, like we don't want just anybody and they have to work with you each day. But then we started paying that and people just were going in and saying, this is the best person I worked with at a job here and they fit the culture. And there were two things that we looked at. One was we wanted, you know, that top 1% really smart, high aptitude people. But if those people didn't fit the culture, we didn't hire them. Like the culture became the number one thing. And we did something that is still done today there that I take a lot of pride in. And that is each time we hire, we would bring people in to interview in the morning 
typically around 9.30 or 10. Because if we felt that we were interested in them after the first few people they spoke with, we would invite them to go to lunch. And when we would go to lunch, we went to the same restaurant for years and years, big round table, fit eight people. We would bring four to five people in different departments from Archer to go there. And it wasn't an interview as much as it was, we wanted to see how the conversation expanded, right? Like if it was just a really dynamic, open discussion, it was fun, people were engaged. We knew that they had all the other skills. Now they have the culture fit we're looking for. Some people that we were really high on just couldn't hold a conversation with the other team members. It was really hard. And we had to make the hard decision to say they fit, but not with the culture, you know, the interaction. So we didn't hire them. But what happened over time was that we built this really unique group of people that all had the same experience of going through the same interview at the same place. Like we started to build this background story and it, 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 it's just amazing. Now, you know, people met and got married in the company. We were okay with that. People had kids and now their kids work in the company, <laughs> you know, that's interns. Like it just created a really unique uh, culture. And the, of all the things that we did right at Archer, the one that made the most difference was the people we hired and the culture that that brought. I think this is so valuable. And, and I think, um, um, for our listeners to take, take note what you just said, because a lot of companies, uh, when it comes to hiring, they look very short term, which means is I need to fill a position. I need to fill it now. And therefore, um, yes, they'll do interviews. They'll do a fast, a fast process, an interviewing process, but you're not looking at what it's going to do for the culture long term or even not even if the long, long past this person's left the company, even, you know, what will that person bring to the culture as a, as a whole? And I think this is what you're saying is so important. And I'll just add another thing that I took out of what you just said is a lot of companies are short on staff and they'll pay recruiters and they'll do everything and spend a lot of money, all kinds of ads to get their resumes in. Now, why not, why not incentivize your own team that knows your culture, knows, knows the infrastructure, knows everything about it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. They should go out and, 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 and bring you candidates. It's the nicest thing you could do for your culture. That's exactly what we did. And I, you know, there's a difference between bootstrapped founders and founders that have raised some pretty significant funds early on in that the bootstrap founders tend to, to find ways to go attract talent like we did, because you don't have a lot of, you don't have $20,000 to spend on a recruiter for a job that's there, right? You want to pay that to the people you hire that's there. Venture back companies are under more pressure to grow faster typically, and that it's harder for them to build a culture because they're just hiring a lot of people in a lot of different positions really early on. And you just have to see if they mix. And if they don't work out, you just let them go. And that creates a culture on its own when you bring people in and then let them go. And we were really fortunate at Archer that we did have moments like that where there was people we had to let go, but it was very few. And I was also very adamant that the person that made the decision to hire the person was the person that had to have the conversation with me to let them go. And that changed how people do interviews for us. Like nobody... A couple of people were involved and we had to let somebody go and like they never want that experience again. Like it's e even if somebody's not performing, you know, if you're a human, it's very hard to have a conversation and say, this isn't for you. You need to go find another job and just understand how they're feeling at that moment. And you experience that a few times. You realize, all right, I'm going to take an extra day, a week, and I'm going to make sure I've hired the right person because I don't want to have to have that conversation. Very powerful. So let me ask you, if you built a company with that passion and in and, and, and putting the priorities, obviously on the product, but ultimately on culture, when it comes to making a decision of who your potential buyer of the company is, obviously, was there a bidding war, so to speak, a multiple buyers coming to you and trying to figure out, okay, who is the best, uh, you know, synergy and the best strategic buyer for us? Or was it a one-off offer that you, that you weren't even in the market? Like if you could share some of that process. Sure. Yeah, we knew at Archer that one of our existing customers was likely going to become a buyer of the product. In the case, we sold to EMC, but inside of EMC in the RSA division, they used our product to manage services that they provided back to their customers that were there. So they, we knew that, that at some point they would probably be interested on that. They came to us first, but then we, we had just brought in Bain Capital as an investor in the secondary that we did. And Bain said, this sounds really great, 
but we need a little more leverage in the discussions. We need to go out and see if anybody else has interest, right? So they found some other parties right away that had some level of interest. And that just helped us with our discussions with EMC so that we felt that we weren't getting pushed around as much as it was more a mutual discussion of value on both sides. And it was the the CEO and president of the RSA division of EMC that did the acquisition. And we built a really good relationship and I felt really good about the culture that they had and that Archer had, that it was going to be a good fit. Now, after the acquisition, we learned, I learned a lesson in that, you know, a 43,000 person company, even with a good culture is very different than the culture in a 200 person company. So there was a lot that we had to sacrifice and give up. I'll give you a good example. We had a person on the payroll who was our director of community. And her only job was to get all of our employees involved in the community each each week. We gave each employee, I think, two and a half days of time off outside of vacation and PTO for them just to go to their kids' school events, to be involved in Habitat for Humanity, for whatever. And our community director was responsible for finding all these opportunities in the community, bringing them back, and then making sure that every employee used their two and a half days that were there. That's a whole conversation on culture that that builds when you go do something outside of work with your team members. But EMC came in and said, we don't need that position, right? So that was a struggle for us when we saw them cut some of the positions that we thought were so important to what had become the culture. The second thing that EMC said to us was that um, we're going to move your operations to Boston where we're located and we're going to move everybody from Kansas City and we're going to change the name from Archer to I think it was RSA security, something division and the customers went crazy that that would happen. And 20 years later, it's still in the same location. The name is (laughs) still Archer. It's funny that the culture won is what I'm trying to say over the big guy in that, that is. Got it. Um, So is the purchase public information? Like if, when you made that exit, like what type of purchase number just for, for our listeners to get an understanding? Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's all public there uh, since it was through a public company, but it's a little less than two hundred million. So let's let's fast forwards. There's a lot of lessons there, and uh, I know we could do a podcast only on that. But I do want to move to uh, Smart Suite because this is more of a um, direct to consumer, direct to company, not an enterprise product. And I know that there's a lot of a lot of questions I have as far as what got you to develop it, what problem you're trying to solve. So obviously you, you, you took some time off and as an entrepreneur, you can't, <laughs> it, there is a limit to how much time off you could take. Right. So walk us through like, where was the inspiration for Smart Suite? Yeah. You know, when I, w- when we sold Archer and then we took a period of time off, what I didn't realize was that I really needed a mental break. We've been going so hard for so long. I was just that way, but I was getting tired. And it took a couple of years, to be honest, to like just for me to get charged back and find the energy that I wanted to have to go after my passion again. And what we did during that time was we invested in a lot of startups and through a lot lot of venture funds, probably 400 companies in total at some level. So I did a lot of advising. With, had a chance to meet with lots of entrepreneurs, with companies that were small and struggling to companies that were just like on a you know a racetrack. They were just growing so fast uh, that was there. There was one theme that kept coming out of the, a lot of the discussions that I had. They'd say, John, you're a process guy. What products should we use to manage all the processes in our business, right? And we would we had this big diagram and all these different products. Like this is what you use for sales. This is what you use for marketing. This is what you use for HR, for operations, for finance. And I took a step back and I'm like, you need just people need a single platform that allows them to manage processes across those that I just mentioned, plus a whole host of others where they don't need to have to go out and buy all these point solutions and then find ways to integrate the content between the point solutions because they need data and dashboards, charts to understand the the health of their business and understand how to grow it, like what's working, what's not working that's there. So the idea behind uh, SmartSuite initially was one core platform to manage any process or project. Now we provide uh, native integrations with um, over 6,000 other products through our connectors that that we have. So if you use Salesforce and you want to integrate data with Salesforce into all the other processes that you have because of accounts and contacts, you just turn that on and the sync kind of happens that's there. So we realize that not every company will use us to manage all their processes, but what we're finding is that 
once a company starts with one process, we see them grow to two to three to four kind of over time. And what's unique, what we wanted to be unique about SmartSuite early on was that we saw in this overall industry of software SaaS companies, we saw project management companies like a Monday, uh, a ClickUp, a Rike, and a Sauna. And then we had more database process driven types of SaaS companies like an Airtable, a ServiceNow, and Open Pages. And then we saw this unstructured data starting to happen with like a Google Doc, a Notion, a Coda, where they were documents, but they were bringing in some structured data that was there. And we thought, you know, to really manage things in a business, I need all of those capabilities in one platform. So I don't have to pick from those three categories. That's just three more tools to have. So when you looked at these different so, um, um, software you just mentioned, you figured that uh, that if you have a no-code system like SmartSuite, then then people could start eliminating some of those additional softwares and those those processes could be run 100% through, um, through SmartSuite? That, that's exactly true. So. What, what we feel has happened over the last three to four years is that no code is just really taking off as a concept and products in every category use no code. And no code is just a fancy word for using drag and drop to configure things and not have to write code, yeah. right? And, you know, just in the last couple of years, you've seen like a hundred products just in the sales industry that are different point solutions to manage different things. It's just exploded. And then you see some in marketing, some in HR. And the problem that that creates is that now I have lots of great point solutions that I'm happy with, but they don't talk to each other. Access control now that to sign somebody up, I have to give them access control to five, six, seven different products. When they leave, they've got data in all these different places. I have to figure out what systems like I can't get the management reporting. So the thought behind the single platform to manage processes was we natively and we solve all those problems. Now I can connect sales with marketing with product in some minutes and I can share that data. It's access controlled at a level that's even better than the point solutions. And then management can run charts and dashboards across anything, any process that's in their workspace to really understand the health of the business. So once upon a time when somebody needed software was custom software. So enterprise was spending millions of dollars in developing and the small business owner was left using Google Sheets or, or Excel. And, and what, what I find is that, that you know, one of the things I deal with a lot of business owners and if a business owner doesn't have the finger on the pulse on the, on the most important key metrics of the company, they're definitely not um, getting to the fullest potential because if they have to dig for information or if they don't even know like, oh, this, I need to ask my bookkeeper, this, I need to use my, ask my project manager, this, I need to physically go over to this person asking where we are with this project. There's so much wasted time. And when it comes to decision making, you don't have the, the data in order to make a, a sound decision. So I think it's, there's no excuse today with no code systems, uh, regardless of it's smart suite or any of the other tools out there with connections today. The setup could be so creative based on the connectors. And I think, um, another thing that really exploded in, 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 in kudos to tools like smart suite and the connect, the connectors is once upon a time, you had to force on uh, you know, pieces of technology on your team. And I could see it from my own team. So we have a creative agency and I know that the more complicated the system is, the less accurate the data is for my, because if, if a client calls up for five minutes or 10 minutes of a change on something, if, if it's a five click process for them to actually, um, you know, attract that piece of information, it's not happening, ain't happening. Right. But so throughout the years, I've realized that, look, I'll give you the most easiest time tracker. But then I'll have for my, for, for, for management, we'll have a totally different dashboard, but it connects and talks to each other. So you don't have to force on pieces of technology to teams that, that just ends up being a hassle on the team or not, not accurate data. Yeah, it, it, exactly. What you hit on is so important to any product. And it's something that we thought about early on at SmartSuite in that who are we selling to and who are we building the software product for? Right. And what we found was that we started to build the product in a way that millennials and Gen Zers understood the product based on their background, meaning it was very collaborative in nature. It, I could collaborate in the context of the work that's being done, whether that's a comment or a, I want to notify somebody or I want to send an email. I don't have to go into my email. You could do it all inside a smart suite in the context of what you're working on this there. But we also found 
that the presentation of the information, like you were mentioning, was so important to millennials and that they wanted more bright, vivid colors. You know, they didn't like the old, just black and white screen. They got bored. They didn't want to do their job. You know, people in some cases select the companies they work with based on the tech stack that the company has. And that's because that's interesting to them. And I think that's what's starting to take place right now in the software world is people are getting a little more focused on who does the work in the company each day. And most of the time it's the younger people. And then you have management that's a little older that are looking at dashboards and benchmarks and reports, understanding the health of things, but the work, the day-to-day -day activities happening by the younger generation that's there. So the software needs to support their needs. So let me speak about, uh, you know, people listening to this, and I, I've seen it many, many times in, in group chats or, or even face-to-face -face at events where people will say, I'm looking for a new project management tool. I'm looking for something, yeah? And what type of homework would you tell our listeners um, as they're going through the process of vetting the proper system for their needs? What is something that you would coach a person to say, okay, if, instead of going for every bell and whistle and every t a new shiny object that's out there, how do we come up with a list of what their needs are in order to figure out which is the best system and software for them? Two, two points that I typically talk to people about in regards to any software, not just if you're looking for project management that's there. The first one is, do you understand the features that are available and that you need? And if they say, I don't really understand what's even available, like I know what the end goal needs to be, but how do I get there? I don't know what features. So I say, okay, most no-code products, SaaS products, are have a free trial, 14 days, almost everyone. So you need to just jump in and, and spend 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and just look at each one just at a high level. And then you'll start to understand these are some of the features that they have that I would find interesting in my process. But then stop for just a minute and think about your process. Like what's the actual process that you want to do that's there? And just map it out. And it could be a simple flow chart on a piece of paper uh, that's there. Once you do that, then, okay, now let's go look at some of these products and let's build that use case very simply that's in there. And then we can do a comparison in real time. In the old days, you weren't able to do comparisons and you had to have salespeople involved and it just got more complicated. But now, most of the time, you can go start a free 14-day trial of about any product. You don't have to talk to a salesperson. You can just give it give it a try. What the products that, that we like to use typically have some type of templates available. And we build a lot of templates into SmartSuite as well so that if you have a a process that you want to do, we want to show you a series of ways to do that with a single click that you can see what a beginning process looks like, more intermediate, maybe more advanced. Maybe it's a sell CRM light versus this is like a Fortune 100 CRM. So you start to understand, like, where am I at, where do I want to be, and then make that decision. And in terms of, of uh, how much would you advise pe leaders to, uh, how much do they, should they involve their team in making a decision on which system to use? Like on the, like you mentioned before, the people actually going to be using the system. I can tell you the research that we've done of the people that purchase our product in most cases, like 80% are not the, the people writing the check. They're the end users doing the work. And that's, that's who we feel should actually do the analysis for you and make the recommendation uh, that's there. That other 20%, we have CEOs that have purchased our product and implemented it across. But when you have people that are doing the work, helping make the decision, they have ownership right at the beginning, regardless of the product that you pick, in that they were involved and it becomes more of their product versus this is what we're going to use, right? And now they have to, nobody likes being told <laughs> You're just going to use it. That's the way it is like to be involved in the process. So I, I would say get your team members involved as early as you can in just looking at the options and having discussions. I know you're very passionate about smart suites and the features and everything that's, that's being built into the software. I, I guess it's a twofold question. One is, um, how much of the growth in, on the, on the feature side of things are you depending on? your own internal team as far as building it out versus direct feedback from, from your clients? It's 90% plus that is the direct feedback from the clients. We call it customer first, and we often refer to it as customer-inspired development. So we have a public roadmap where every customer, and you don't even have to be a customer, you can see our public roadmap. You can see all the features that have been requested. You can vote on those features. 
we respond back to those features. And sometimes we do it publicly. Sometimes we reach out directly to the person for competitive reasons. Like we don't want all our competitors to see all the designs that we're working on that are there. And then I meet on average with two customers a day talking about just features. And I, I try to bring it up to use cases. So I understand the use case and like people sometimes come and say, I need this one feature. And we're saying, okay, I get it. Like they're saying, just add this checkbox here and, and that'll work fine. We like to be a little more thoughtful and say, okay, help us understand what you're trying to accomplish. And we may even find a better way. And that's where our team gets involved on the designers is now they understand what the outcome needs to be. How do we build it in so everything feels like it fits into the software? This is so valuable. Like uh, I think our listeners uh, need to uh, need to um, listen to this again because so many people in the software business, in particular, but even every business, even the service providers, um, sometimes we're so in our bubble and into how we want to see things and how we feel people will potentially use our soft our system, software products, whatever it is, and and sometimes we 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 just totally forget about asking our clients and. Commit, you know, a leader of a company committing to two clients a day, that, that's a huge commitment. Uh, and, and obviously it probably pays off in order to make sure that that that's the proper roadmap for the, for the developers to do. For, for sure. Like I, I'm number one is I'm a product person that acts like a CEO. Uh-huh. Like I, I want to be in, in my perfect world. I'm working on the product the majority of every day, you know, that's there and getting feedback. And a couple of things happen when you get feedback. Number one is you start to build a relationship with your customers. They begin to understand that you're going to listen to them and you have to deliver. Like you can't just get feedback and not deliver that's there, but you, you begin to build the relationship so that if they, you don't have a feature or two that they need right now, they at least feel like you're going to listen to them and have it at some point in the future uh, that's there. And the second thing it does is it, Once every two weeks, we bring a group of customers together on a call between 10 and 20 people to talk about a particular topic, a feature that we're building that's more complex, bigger, and they're experts in that area. But then we get the customers talking to each other about the use cases. And one customer is thinking, wow, that's a great idea. I could be doing that in my business. And then that helps us have an even better outcome on the feature that's developed. And then we have 10 to 20 people that when the feature does come out, already kind of know about it that can help explain things on the decisions that we made to other users. Beautiful. So let me ask you, obviously you deal with a lot of customers, as you mentioned, and what could you give advice for our listeners? Uh, Sometimes you could see companies get excited about the new system software process and, and they implement it beautifully, flawlessly, and it's implemented nicely with adoption. While others, you could have companies implement and they find out, no, there's no adoption to it. There's no, you know, it's, it's just not they taken off. What advice could you tell our listeners of how to go about that process? Another great question. Most of the time that software implementations fail, it's because of the process that you've built in. It's either too simple and it doesn't get to the end point that you need at the end, or it's too complex and you're not using all the inputs at the end of, you know, looking at the health of the business. So you're doing a lot of busy work and the people don't love to do that. So a couple of things happen when you start to talk about complex processes, you need to think about, do I really need those steps? And if I do, can I use automation to perform the role of the user that's there? So the user doesn't have to do so much busy work. Like there's a lot of people cut and paste this link from here to here and do this. What could you just create a button that just click the button and it does all those things for you, right? So we, we tend to, when people don't have adoption, we look at it as either under, under delivered or over delivered on the, you know, the, the state of the process that's there to help companies with that. A lot of companies are doing what we do now is we have a daily office hours that are available each morning for an hour that you can jump on live and talk with one of our folks. And you'll have sometimes eight to 10 other people, sometimes 20 that are on that call. And what happens is if you talk about your process, you're going to get feedback, not just from us, but of the other people. And we kind of jointly help you work through what the issue is. We also have one-on-one capabilities. You can click in the bottom right corner of our product and have a discussion with one of our onboarding specialists. And their goal is to help understand your process and then help you compare it to other customers that we have. So we could say, kind of here's where you stack up and here's what we see other people do to help you get that right. But for our team, it all start. We model the process out, even if it's on a piece of paper or a whiteboard as we're talking. So we understand, like, 
do we really know what the outcome is? And does the process support getting to the outcome that you're looking for? So let me ask you, um, you know, obviously we're speaking about technology in today's day and age. Um, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot ignore the, the, the part of AI, obviously. Um, AI, I've seen some of enhancements and stuff that you, you mentioned about building AI into the platform. I guess my question to you is seeing technology, learning technology, knowing technology, living technology. A, what could you share with us? Like how is um, Smart Suite using AI and to enhance the daily experience and ultimately the work that your clients are doing with the platform? And then just your overall opinion of where you feel AI is going in the near future. Sure. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I had the chance to be at the Startup Grind conference, which is like the largest startup conference in the world. Um, two, two and a half weeks ago in Silicon Valley. And, you know, this, this conference, I, I don't know exactly how many people, but it seemed like there was three, 4,000 people. Wait there. a minute. Is that where, where you got an award? We, we did. We, we actually won a global SaaS startup of the year, which was very, very cool. Congratulations for you and your team. Thank you. <laughs> and what was interesting is that during the day, they had a main session that had a few thousand people in it you could go to, and they would have unicorn SaaS companies that had done really well, along with the people that invested in them. And they'd have a conversation for like 30 minutes about the company, where it's headed, what they're seeing in the industry that's interesting. There's no question that every one of those companies talked about AI in every kind of industry you can imagine. And at the end, the president of Y Combinator got up on board with one of on stage with one of the largest AI investment venture funds. And they said, you just don't understand what's going to happen. Like you're all tech people. You're all using AI. You still don't understand how big this is. This is bigger than the industrial revolution that happened. Like they just started going through things in history and just said, this is going to dwarf anything we've ever seen as a civilization is getting ready to change with AI because it's going to be used to perform all kinds of automated tasks that people need to go do, but don't necessarily want to do that, that's there. And they were pretty adamant to say, there's a number of jobs that are gonna be displaced for sure. But overall, the, the type of work that people do is gonna change and that there, people are gonna become more familiar with how to ask questions inside of AI to get the appropriate responses that help them in their jobs. Now, in the case of Smart Suite, We've been headed down that path, but it was just so interesting to hear this from kind of the who's who of, of how big this really is. In Smart Suite, our customers first ask for just simple things. Like we have a smart doc field type that's like a notion code of Google Doc capability. And they said, we just need the ability to generate and review and summarize content inside of a smart doc field. So you could say, I'm writing a marketing blog. These are the keywords that need to be optimized for XYZ. Here's the audience. And it would create the content for it. Some people would say, I get product requirements that come in from customers. And when it first comes in, I need you to summarize the information and create three questions I could ask the customer that helps me better dive in on the use case. And in some cases, I want you to ask those three questions and send them right back to the customer with no interaction from me. But it's all about summarizing and generating content. What happened next is people wanted to create workflows using AI. So they could come in and say, I'm an automotive dealer. I need a better way to manage relationships with my customers and I have a service department and it would go create a CRM that was specific to what you just asked for inside of smart suite. The next piece that we saw is that when you have a lot of data inside a table in smart suite, let's say it's a list of all of your contracts with all the information about the type of the length and the size and type and all that you want to ask questions like who, who are my most profitable customers? All right. How did I, how did I get those customers, right? Did I get through marketing campaigns, word of mouth, direct outreach, right? I want to do more of that. That's what we're working on now is chatbots that pull from the data that allow you to ask questions. And in some cases you can say, I, I want you to also create a dashboard with a series of benchmarks and charts and graphs that relate to this question that I just asked you. So I can really analyze it there. That is fun. Like we're having a lot of fun, you know, looking into different businesses, pulling out the data and helping them understand how do you better manage. It's amazing. Yeah, like we are like everybody says we're at the tip of the iceberg and this is already the capability. It's like and I think uh, you mentioned something so important for our listeners and people get like 
uh, the shiny object. Okay, it's AI. What could I do with it? I always tell um, my clients, that's not the right approach. The approach is, what are the tasks you don't like doing? Or what are the things that you're not the best at? And now ask, is there a way from automation and uh, AI, the combination of the two, that c- that could be replaced? You know, I, I was actually at a conference um, this week and I spoke and there was a conference a little bit on AI uh, for beginners, for business owners. And I said, you know, my podcast um, from out of 23 steps, 21 of those are automated or using AI in order to prepare us for it. Because otherwise I don't have the time. Like I'm doing three, three podcasts a week uh, and, you know, and, and I have a full time job. So, so which means is that, that instead of saying, okay, let me start playing around with AI. Let me find a task or a project that I'm doing that maybe somebody's doing manually or so on, so on and so forth that I can start using AI for it. And it's amazing the capabilities. Like I'll give you just one use case that, uh, that, that we use internally. So we, we recently rebranded Ptex Group, um, ptexgroup.com, and we've put in a lot of effort to UI, UX, and obviously in, in coding it to making sure that there's a lot of resources there on the podcast and so on and so forth. Now, of course, you put in some analytics, you put in some tools in the back end. So we installed Microsoft Clarity for our listeners. It's free. It's a tool that gives you so much, so much insight on your website. They built in now AI to the recordings. So instead of me watching all these recordings, I hit one button and it gives me a summary that I could literally take and send to our developers. Hey, there's a Java error that some of the people are hitting. Most people get stuck on this page or most people spend time on this page. Oh, wow, they're interested in this. Let me build it up. Let me add. Once upon a time, this is hours of work or most people don't even focus on that. They don't do anything about it. So to our listeners, speaking about AI and hearing like how SmartSuite is using it in the same way, how could we have the data? You're putting all these input. How could you now extract the data and make faster decisions? How could you extract the data and expand, use it for marketing purposes? And I think that's the mindset everyday business owners have to have from here on. For, for sure, yeah. We had a customer that did a webinar last Wednesday that shows off the AI and automation in the way that they have built and automated their business. They're a podcast company with 18 employees. They're all remote. He says that through the automation in 20 days from the time he started Smart Suite until he did the demo was 20 days, which is pretty cool. He's saving six to $8,000 a month in costs because of the way they've been able to Amazing. automate things. When you post this podcast, I'll put a link to that down below because in 10 minutes, you will see the power of AI from somebody that's not super technical but is doing some amazing stuff because they just know how to ask questions. They, they did simple things like they took our API documentation and send it to chat GPT and said, I need to integrate uh, smart suite with this product and I need code. And I want it to be able to click a button inside of smart suite. He gave him the code. He typed in, he goes, I have no idea what this code does, but now I've automated this whole process of a recording gets done. It goes through Descript. It pulls the information in. It creates my LinkedIn posts, my Instagram short story, like all these things. He said that we're taking hours of somebody's time now just happen. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, we will actually link it up on the show notes. And, and on, as I mentioned to you on the, on the new PTEX website, we, we break down the podcast with resources and everything. So it's going to be in the show notes on, on, under this episode. So last question on, on smart suite. Uh, you know, I know you're ambitious. You have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, strategic goals. Like where do you see smart suite in, in a couple of years from now? We're having an amazing time working with customers and just every kind of use case they have, it's our job to figure out how do we manage that in a single platform for them. So um, you're seeing a lot of things happen with us right now on the interface side to make things even simpler for general users that need to just come in and interact, but a little more feature wise for the people behind the scenes that are doing the heavy lifting on things. Um, and then the AI that we mentioned, you know, how do we integrate AI in a way that's non-intrusive to the people that need to use it. And it's easy for them to kind of digest and understand the value of how, when and how to use it that's there. So a lot of people, when they first come into AI are a little, like they don't understand the concepts, they really don't understand how to use it. So we try to put it in context as much as we can, like just write a sentence, describe this. I'll give you a good example. We have a formula builder in SmartSuite and you can write a really simple formula at times, field A times you know, field B, or you could write formulas that are nested if statements that are four paragraphs long, like super complex. We're adding AI to allow you to just tell us that I need to create a formula that summarizes information on a risk assessment across all these data points that are here. 
you know, does X and it just creates it for you. Like you don't have to have a consultant do that for you. You know, it, and you could also say include inline comments so I can understand each line of the formula and what it does. Seconds, it just creates that for you. That's a great use case for somebody that doesn't need to spend an hour learning how to write formulas in SmartSuite. Amazing. Where could people find out more about SmartSuite or, or even follow you for more content? You know, go to smartsuite.com. We have a free 14 day trial. We're happy to extend it to 30 days. If you need more time, you can, at the end of that time, you could move to one of our paid plans. We also have a free plan if you're not ready to make a decision yet. And on our website, if you go to resources, you'll find our blog. We have a video center that just has lots of great content from partners and customers on how they're using the product. And it helps open your eyes to maybe what the capabilities are uh, in different areas. And Obviously, LinkedIn or follow me on LinkedIn. I do a lot of updates there as well. Beautiful. For the links resource mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast, where we'll link to all the resources mentioned in this episode. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, a book that changed your life. A book that changed my life. Probably Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Great book. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Follow the customer. I heard that early on in my career. Nice. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently? You know, I might not have sold our last company, Archer Technology, so soon. You know, we immediately missed the people and the customers uh, once we sold. Yeah. Wow. And last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? Whew, that's a good one. You know, my wife, Tara, and I love to travel. And I think our bucket list is mainly just visiting places that we, we haven't been able to visit yet. Cool. Yeah. Enjoying nature around the world. <laughs> John, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a great conversation. Appreciate it. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends. And if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts, or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a PTEX Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.